Last week, we were treated to a glimpse into the very interesting mind of my old pastor. The response was overwhelming. But our cliffhanger ending left us with many unanswered questions. Will this get better? Will this pastor throw us a curveball and do more than just repeat stale apologetics? And if he does, will the prophet of Zod be able to withstand the withering intellectual firestorm that comes his way? Stay tuned to find out. Jesus himself declared that the Bible is the Word of God. Correction. The Bible says that Jesus said that the Bible is the Word of God. Why do you suppose, 2,000 years later, that it seems like, at least in America, like there's a church on every corner? Because Christianity, won out over all the other populist cults of the time, was adopted by Constantine, became the official religion of the Roman Empire and later the European powers, and was eventually carried around the world by missionaries. Basically, it spread like every other successful religion. You know, a lot of people aren't aware of the fact that Jesus, after he walked out of the tomb, spent 40 days. He appeared to hundreds, maybe even thousands of people, and spent time with them before he returned to heaven. Correction. The Bible says that Jesus did all these things. This is why there's a church on every corner, because these people saw the resurrected Christ. They spent time with him, and they were willing to die before they would deny what they had seen and heard. Yes, that must be why. Just like the only possible reason there's a mosque on every corner in Saudi Arabia is that people saw Muhammad fly to heaven on a horse. And then he wrote this in a letter to the church in Corinth in 15.6. He said, after that, after appearing to the apostles... He appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living. Paul writes them 22 years after the resurrection and says, listen, you don't have to take my word for it. He appeared to more than 500 people at the same time. Most of them are still living. Go ask them. They'll tell you. Evidence, evidence. How many people swear that they saw unmistakable alien activity at Roswell? How many claim to have seen miraculous appearances by the Blessed Virgin Mary? A lot more than 500, and many of them are still alive today. So would you send your congregation rushing to check these stories out? Do you consider them evidence of anything? No, because your healthy skepticism automatically kicks in upon hearing about unusual events related to aliens or Catholicism. You recognize that anything from groupthink to delusion to deception can lead large numbers of people to swear up and down that they witnessed all kinds of strange activity, and that if you accepted this kind of testimony as evidence, you would be forced to indiscriminately absorb countless paranormal or religious claims into your worldview. Thus your skepticism serves you well in helping you filter nonsense and narrow your focus to ideas that are likely and useful. Yet you toss it straight out the window the second you catch whiff of something that might help you feel better about your religion. Convincing yourself to temporarily pretend eyewitness testimony is good reason to believe in even the most far-fetched of claims. Except we're not even talking about eyewitness testimony, are we? We are talking about a book that claims to record an ancient letter from a missionary telling a mostly illiterate congregation that people in another region of the world gave eyewitness testimony. That's literally what you're calling evidence here. Are you proud of yourself? Evidence! Evidence! Peter! who was with Jesus all three years of his ministry, who denied Jesus three times the night of his arrest. This same Peter wrote in 2 Peter 1.16, For we did not follow cleverly invented stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. So a guy writing a persuasive letter actually went out of his way to say he wasn't just making stuff up. Maybe this means Jesus was God. Or maybe, I don't know, maybe you should take his explicit reassurance that he wasn't lying as a red flag? See, it's been said that every person is born with a God-shaped hole. It's a place that only he can fill. 
And some people spend their entire lives trying to fill that hole with other things. That's what she said. <laughs> Think about life, big picture. What, what are people after? Power, money, fame. You know, our world has had a lot of conquerors in history, and in terms of recorded history, we know that Cortez conquered over 300,000 square miles. Napoleon Bonaparte, over 700,000 square miles. Attila the Hun conquered over 1.4 million square miles. Alexander the Great, over 2 million square miles. Genghis Khan, nearly 5 million square miles. And Jesus of Nazareth, one square foot. The space of the hole that the cross was set in when he was crucified. And yet only one of those people split time. Only one. Uh, what? Did you all hear what he just said? He literally compared the conquests of the world's greatest generals to... To what? To the area at the foot of Jesus' cross? But why? Why, with all the possibilities at his disposal, did he choose this as a point of comparison? This humble little square foot of land was not, in any coherent use of the word, Jesus' conquest. It in no way relates to his accomplishment, his influence, or anything else at all. So I can only suspect that implying as much is nothing more than shameless linguistic misdirection. Whether he was a god or just a mostly legendary teacher, Jesus' influence would not be measured by a plot of land, especially one as silly as the hole in which the tool of his execution was mounted. I shouldn't have to explain this, but the spread of religious or philosophical ideas just doesn't work like that. They don't have established boundaries, nor do they show up on a map the same way military conquests do. Yet they still manage to take root and influence society for generations, and there are perfectly good social and political reasons that they do so, leaving us no reason whatsoever to fall back on supernatural explanations. But Pastor doesn't seem interested in even scratching the surface of the complex reasons for Christianity's influence and how it really compared to that of history's great conquerors. Instead, he just expresses the conqueror's achievements in terms of simple square mileage. Then out of all the things about Jesus he could compare this to, he chooses something as utterly irrelevant as the area at the base of the cross. Not to help people better understand anything at all, but to plant the suggestion that Jesus' conquest was so comparatively small that only the supernatural can explain how a large religious movement sprang from this one square foot of conquered territory. He then hypes this comparison further by saying that Jesus alone split time which is just a melodramatic way of saying that Christian Europe organized its calendar around him. This mess of analogies and figurative language is at best a sloppy poetic parallel, and by fast-talking his way through this nonsense for the sake of persuasion, he's either showing himself to be plain stupid or demonstrating a patronizing contempt for his audience. Bill Gates is worth about $80 billion. Warren Buffett, over $70 billion. The four Walmart heirs, about 40 billion each. Mark Zuckerberg, Facebook, about 33 billion. Jesus of Nazareth, when he died, his net worth was zero. But only one of those people split time. Charles Haley won five Super Bowls. Yogi Berra won 10 World Series. Henry Richard won 11 Stanley Cups. Bill Russell, 11 NBA championships that we know of. Jesus of Nazareth never won a single athletic contest, but only one of those men split time. So same argument, except this time he's saying Christianity's rise must be a mystery because Jesus didn't have money or win any sports titles. Brilliant. Also, since he just seems absolutely in love with the phrase split time, let me emphasize that many different cultures orient their calendars around things they find significant. So it sounds really, really silly to hear an educated adult act blown away by the fact that the Christian West centered its calendar around the life of Jesus. What is it about this 33-year-old man, this son of a carpenter who was put to death in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago? I mean, think about it. You know, no TV, radio, newspaper, no internet, no iPhones, no Facebook or Twitter or Instagram, and yet he's managed to collect over 2 billion followers. How can that be? Yep, that's right. 
you literally just heard him express bafflement over the fact that religions developed and spread before the time of social media. What is the greatest thing in the world? What is it? You know, according to Jesus himself, the answer is simple. Because wealth and power and fame can change your circumstances, but they can't change you on the inside where life really matters. If, if money was the key to happiness, Howard Hughes, one of the wealthiest men in human history, wouldn't have died a recluse with fingernails this long and unshaved and long hair and mentally ill. It just didn't do what he thought it was going to do. How many actors, actresses, professional athletes do we see committing suicide on alcohol and drugs in prison, violent crimes? If all, if those things were the key, see, those things all just change circumstances. They don't, they don't make a change where it matters. What's the greatest thing in the world? It's the one thing that changes who you are on the inside, and it's spelled L-O-V-E. And the people who met, met Jesus felt his love intensely. The love poured out of him. It poured out of him. Hey, Christians, you want to know a secret? We in the secular world are very well aware that pursuing the extremes of wealth, fame, or pleasure will lead to an unhappy and probably self-destructive end. And we recognize that it's better to live a well-paced, balanced lifestyle taking care of yourself while contributing to society and tending to healthy relationships. This is no mystery to anybody, yet pastors making it sound like some form of rampant excess is the only possible life goal that non-Christians can conceive of, and that everybody else outside the faith, including those in fields like psychology, sociology, and philosophy, are lost for any other ideas for achieving personal fulfillment. Then, Instead of trying to understand the complex factors that lead to people's personal problems and the equally complex answers for solving those problems, he just says you need to come to Jesus. This is a textbook example of religious people who choose to sit in their bubble and ignore the intelligent conversation the rest of the world is having while pretending the answers are simple and we're just too dumb or sinful to get it. If you ever wonder why the rest of the world seems to ignore you, guess what? This is why. Every seeking heart met love when they met Jesus Christ. Every seeking heart, every willing heart was filled by the love of Jesus Christ. So the question then becomes, are you seeking? Are you willing? I can't let him slide on his assertion that anybody who looks with a sincere heart will come to believe in Jesus. The direct implication, of course, is that nobody can ever have an honest reason for disbelieving your religious claims a poisonous idea backed up by the equally arrogant assumption that you know exactly why another person believes or disbelieves something. The outcome, if not the intention, is to train a congregation to think that anyone outside their religion is purposefully ill-intentioned and, as a result, impede reasonable dialogue with others. Nothing can keep you with your willing heart from the love of the Savior. Nothing, friends. If you are not a Christian, your immortal soul hangs in the balance. No, it doesn't. Eternity is real. No, it isn't. I want you to know a great war is being waged in the heavens. No, it's not. And that sounds like crazy talk and you are the prize. Even if I believed in all these magic armies in the sky, I wouldn't be this delusional about how important I was to them. And you know, there was another time when that angel Gabriel came to Daniel, and he said, you know, you started praying. I'm paraphrasing. He said, the Lord sent me. But a demon who was over the nation of Persia prevented me from coming. So to paraphrase, an angel of the all-powerful, ever-present God somehow managed to get held up on his mission by the presence of a strong demon. Are you at all concerned by the fact that your mythology doesn't match your present-day image of God? And yet this powerful angel sent by God and there was an explosion in the heavenlies and he's held for 21 days. 
And then God sends the, the archangel Michael, and there's another explosion in heaven, and Gabriel is released, and he comes. So material in heaven combusted rapidly with an outward blast? You see, there is a great war being waged in the heavenlies, and you are the prize. If there is a great war being waged in the heavenlies, it's because God either isn't powerful enough to instantly end it, cares so little about his angels and his people that he puts them in peril by failing to act decisively, or he has some mysterious reason for letting the demons kind of win, in which case it's not really a war but theater being staged by God, and I'm not sure why you're being so dramatic about the stakes. Make no mistake, you are going to fall on one side or the other. You are going to fall on one side or the other. Jesus offers you victory, and Satan says, Do you think God really said that? Neither Satan nor God have ever said anything to me. You're the one telling us all this stuff, and my reasonable hesitancy to believe in invisible beings based on ancient scripture is not the same as listening to Satan. When you say it is, you're trying to trap your congregation into obedience by literally demonizing the act of questioning your claims. I want you to read Jesus' own words regarding his love for you. I want all of you to read it, making it personal this time. I want you to read this out loud with me. Can we get this? I want you to read this with me. For God so loved me that he gave his one and only son that if I believe in him, I will not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn me but to save me through him. God so loves me that he'll refrain from eternally torturing me if only I'll believe in his existence without him ever having given me good reason to do so. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn me, but to provide a convoluted way around the fact that he had already condemned me before I was born. Jesus is the rescue party and you are one breath away from drowning. Except if you want to use this analogy, you're only drowning because Jesus dunked you under and his idea of rescuing you is letting you come up for breath if you accept his free gift of no longer holding you underwater. I read this morning of a young man, he's a coal miner, came to a service just like this, heard the gospel and said, this is the day, Lord, this is the day. And he got on his knees and he prayed and he asked Jesus to forgive him. He asked Jesus to save him. He walked out of there a new man. Monday, the mine collapsed and he was dead. They said he lived about three minutes after they drug him out. And what he said in those three minutes, the last words he said is, I'm so glad I met the Lord. He said, I'm so glad I didn't wait. We don't know. We don't know how much time that we have. So this same miner, with the same disposition and personality, would have been burned alive for eternity if the mine had fallen on him a week earlier, or if he'd said the sinner's prayer a week later. Meaning the fate of his eternal soul rested on whether something nudged him to the altar before or after a random accident. Pastors love using stories like these to coerce people into saying the sinner's prayer, but in doing so, they're portraying God as being grotesquely flippant in deciding who goes to heaven or hell. Will you come in humility and ask him to forgive you and save you? See, the empty tomb, the risen Savior, this is not a leap in the dark. It's a decision to walk in the light. And here's the beautiful part. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead is available to every person on earth and to you right now this morning. Don't answer me out loud, but answer these questions honestly to yourself. I'll answer them for me out loud. Have you ever told a lie? Have you? I'll tell you, I have. Have you ever taken anything that didn't belong to you? Have you? I have. Have you ever struggled with lust? I have. Have you ever used God's name to curse? I have. Have you ever said or done anything to dishonor your parents? I have. That's only half of the Ten Commandments. And if I stood before God and he tells the truth, if he's honest, he's going to say, guilty, 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 guilty. 
What about you? I mean, according to God's law, are you innocent or are you guilty when you stand before him? Okay, I think we're all intelligent enough to know that having stolen one thing as a kid doesn't define you as a thief, and having once looked at a dirty magazine doesn't define you as an adulterer, and so on. That's just stupid. To call someone a thief is to say they steal on a regular basis by habit or profession, and appropriating the word to describe an upstanding citizen who once stole something does nothing but muddy the definition of the word and confuse your understanding of who the person really is. Look, we've all engaged in varying levels of unconstructive behavior, and we should take those behaviors and their consequences seriously. But lumping them all together under the label of sin robs us of insight into the varying nature, severity, and outcome of the different deeds. When we imagine that an action magically tarnishes us and puts a deadly stain on our soul, we not only blow that action out of proportion, but we obsess over the equally magical act of removing the stain, thus impeding our process of trying to understand, correct, and when necessary make amends for those behaviors. Do many Christians also confront the practical consequences of their actions? Sure. But when we believe that praying for forgiveness instantly cleanses us of sin, then we find too much closure in an imaginary process, feeling that the most important part of our problem has been solved before we've even taken the first step to deal with or reflect on our actions. And the fact that this pastor urges people to handle life's most serious problems in such a shallow and superstitious way is perhaps the most damaging part of his entire presentation. I honestly don't care whether he's sincere or not. Even if he believes everything he's saying, the best we can assume about him is that he spent a lot of time choosing not to give adequate thought to these issues, allowing himself to become horribly deluded, and as a consequence losing control of his message and misleading hundreds of people in ways that will truly impact their lives. This kind of intellectual laziness is on some level a choice, and when you teach others, it's a choice that has consequences. In my mind, that level of carelessness is no better than lying.